This is a production of Cornell University. So I'm going to talk about the impact of land use and land cover change on climate. Can you, can you hear with this microphone? or It's kind of far from me. Okay. Um, and um, this is work, uh, to some extent, based on three papers that we did in my group. So this is, uh, for me, a combination of the research we've been doing in my group, as well as uh, a, a teaching seminar. And so uh, this is the first time I've done something like this. So we'll, we'll see how this works. Um, most of the time we think about climate change as being driven by energy, and, and I think that's an accurate assessment of climate change. But one um, interesting thing that, that we became interested in a few years ago is the controversy over the role of land use, agriculture, deforestation in climate change and in climate mitigation as well. Right now, deforestation represents about 20% of the current CO2 uh, concentrations, uh, elevated concentrations from anthropogenic activity, as well as the emissions uh, around that range. And of course, there's uh, the threats of continued and enhanced deforestation, especially in the tropics, where people are really interested in the biodiversity. Of course, on the other hand, in agriculture, um, intensive agriculture in the United States and developed countries, as well as developing country, it, there's quite a bit of emissions of other greenhouse gases like methane and nitrous oxide. So what is the role, what should be the role of, of land use in, in thinking about climate change? Right now, well, or under the Kyoto Protocol in the EU, there's the carbon development mechanism which you can use preventing deforestation or, or, or other such projects to try to offset carbon emissions from facilities in the EU. But it, it, um, it's pretty difficult to get those approved just because it's, uh, it's a very time-consuming process. Um, there's also the UN RED program, which is reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation in developing countries. And, and these are very controversial. They're controversial within the climate change community. Uh, the people like me, when I go to meetings, people are really unsure whether we should include land use in the problem, as well as um, here's some examples of, of just some publicity I got off the web. And, you know, no red, our forests are not commodities, or, you know, red, a false solution to climate change. On the other hand, other people see red uh, as one element of a green economy, okay? So it's really quite controversial, and I guess in our group we wanted to, to think about the impact of land use and land cover change, which is deforestation, agriculture, everything we do on the land, and the interaction with, with climate change. Um, from my perspective, you know, climate change, which, which is what I study, I'm really uh, um, mostly about climate change, uh, it, um, it's one of the many questions we have to address uh, as we move forward in society. Well, one kind of broader question that I think is really interesting is how in the world are we going to feed 10 or 11 billion people um, and maintain any biodiversity and uh, some kind of environmental resilience? I mean, this is, to me, a really, really big question. And, and climate change is what, just one tiny part of it. That, uh, you know, for example, I go down to the Ithaca Farmer's Market, maybe you do too, and I buy, uh, I try to buy my produce there, I try to generate it in my backyard. C can we really feed 10 billion people on organic, locally grown food? Or are we going to have to cut down all the forests to make it so that people can do that? Because it's less efficient than large-scale industrialized agriculture. Now, this isn't what I study. Um, but I think it's a really important question. How in the world are we going to, to, to try to feed all these people and maintain any biodiversity? And then there's a lot of courses and professors at Cornell who think about this in this room as well. Um, so, but I think that that's a broader question that we all uh, should be thinking about. Just recently, um, E.O. Wilson, um, I guess, just published a book, or um, the book just got, got publicity and was brought to my attention, and he proposes to set aside one half of the Earth's land, and I think it, the same for the ocean, a good part of the ocean, for preserves in order to maintain biodiversity. So uh, right now, for, for biodiversity issues or maintaining the number of species that we have, it, it's really mostly about land use. And it won't be for another 100 years or something that you, you, wanna, you would be worried about climate change so much. I mean, basically, if you don't have any tropical forests, it really doesn't matter if you stopped all climate change, right? There's no 
tropical forest species left. You, you've killed them all, okay? And it's the same thing for every different ecosystem. You actually have to have some land in that ecosystem to maintain any of that ecosystem. For example, you know, short grass prairie in the Midwestern United States is actually mostly taken out or long grass prairie, right? There's a lot of different ecosystems and if they're replaced by agriculture, the species simply can't exist. So his uh, proposal here, uh, just taken from the New York Times, is just if we leave 50% of the habitat as natural, then we will save uh, you know, 80% of the species, but we'll still lose 16% of the species. Um, but we won't, you know, if we continue on the, the path we're on now, where most of the land is managed, heavily managed with agriculture, or just managed with agriculture, we're going to lose, you know, maybe a third of our species or more. You know, it's, it's really about how much land you keep in natural lands or not. So this is an interesting question uh, from my perspective, is how is biodiversity and the maintenance of these natural lands related to the question of of uh, agriculture and land use. Now, land use land cover change, which is um, often abbreviated as LULCC, okay, and it'll be abbreviated as that in my talk, it, it's a very complicated issue. And some of the issues with red, for example, have to do with property rights, where you, you, know, you take forested lands that you know, nobody cares about, but people are using, and then all of a sudden you may give them a price that that's going to change different people's access to that, and especially say indigenous people or or people who don't have uh, who aren't very empowered might have problems. There's always issues with political corruption. There's land grabs going on. Um, one has to think about you know poverty issues. If the only place that these people can get any food is to go into a, a tropical forest, I mean, what, you know, how are you going to stop them? They're going to starve to death. I mean, these are really important issues. Now, on the other hand, when you, when you think about RAD program or the CDM mechanism within the Kyoto Protocol, how, how permanently are they stopping the deforestation? Is it just temporary? Because you know, once you emit the fossil fuel CO2, it's in the atmosphere for a really long time. So if you're going to offset those emissions with stopping deforestation, it better stay there for a really long time. So um, that's, a, that's a really tricky issue. Um, also, some people are talking about afforestation and um, expanding forest areas, especially in high latitudes and, and some of the ramifications for that. So and, um, I'm not really going to address those points, but they're really important points when you think about land use, land cover change. So here, uh, I'm really just going to present some results about with the globally average, you think of the whole system, what, what's going on, and how important is land use, land cover change for climate forcing on a few different timescales. Of course, um, in last talk, Professor Peter Hess talked about short versus long lived and the controversy there. And, and in another way, you could think about that as the air pollution co-benefits of climate. But it, you know, it turns out you want to clean up aerosols for air quality, which you really, we all want them, <laughs> people to clean up aerosols for air quality. It's going to make the climate problem worse. Okay. Um, you could think here maybe uh, maybe we're thinking about the climate co-benefits of biodiversity conservation. Okay, and um, uh, uh, Professor Christy Goodall later on is going to talk more about terrestrial ecosystems and climate. So she's going to get more into the um, processes that are relevant for that. And, and Dave Wolf will talk about climate change and the future of food. So. Um, this talk is going to be the kind of the intersection on the global level of, of land use, land cover change on some different time scales. So this graph is the radiative forcing of climate between 1750 and 2011, and this comes from the IPCC, and I think you've seen this a few times. Um, I think I've seen this a few million times, but th this is really a classic figure talking about climate change, and you know, here's our CO2. The, the main driver of the warming. The other greenhouse gases here contributing uh, some, but not as much as CO2. Um, some other processes. Here we have the land use surface albedo that we'll be talking about um, later that, that's probably a cooling. Then we have the aerosols, which are really uncertain. They have this huge air bar here, but they um, are probably cooling the planet a little bit. Okay, so we're going to think about this radiative forcing, right, and everything over here is warming and the, the aerosols are cooling a little bit, the land use might be cooling a little bit. And um, it, we're going to think about this slide, but, it, but in a slightly different way later on um, in the, in the um, talk. When we think about future projections, um, I think you've also seen this slide before. This is the radiative forcing that we think we've applied over the historical time period from 1850 to 2000. 
And then these are our different pathways, representative concentration pathways, or RCPs that, that people are, are just kind of putting up there as possibilities for the future. Here's the 8.5, which in, until the Paris Agreement was probably, we, we were probably above the 8.5, maybe not, depends how you calculate it, but, but now maybe we're on the 8.5 or even below the 8.5. That, that would be great if we weren't on this really high one. Um, and that the lowest is the, the 2.6 here, which actually requires negative emissions, and I think everybody has to become a vegetarian and uh, all sorts of things like that, um, th that make it pretty unlikely, but uh, a possibility. So these are the radiative forcings in the representative concentration pathways, and we have intermediate pathways as well. But then the bottom slide is then the temperatures. And um, of course, there's, there's more space. Spread. There's a variety in what the models are predicting with this model output here because we, we don't quite know uh, what the response is going to be. And, and to some extent, that's largely because the aerosols are so uncertain in the current climate. But, we, but um, climate sensitivity is, is an interesting in topic, but um, not something we can talk about too much here. Then also, Professor Hess uh, showed this slide that because of the long lifetime of CO2, it really, it's, the focus has to be on CO2, um, that the cumulative anthropogenic emissions is related to then the temperature change that we have uh, relative to the pre-industrial. And you know, if you go with the higher, temp or the higher CO2 emissions, you're going to get higher temperature changes. right? And in the end, the, the CO2 is going to dominate this, just because of the long lifetime, really. So some of what um, I'm going to show you results from actually includes uh, climate model um, results. And of course, uh, their climate models can be simple energy balance models or full complexity models. And I'm going to use more full complexity models in this. And basically, they divide up the world into little grids. And maybe New York, the whole state of New York is two grid boxes or something like that, OK, if you're lucky. And then it also divides up the atmosphere vertically and the oceans as well and the land surface. Um, and so these models are related to, to weather models. They're, they're not perfect, but we, we put in everything we know about how the system works, and we, we put them in these models. And that's basically what a climate model is, or the Earth system models are. In addition, you know, for the RCPs, the representative concentration pathways, we, uh, we use something called integrated assessment models, IAMs, integrated assessment models. And um, they divide the world up not in little grid cells, you know, in thousands and thousands of little grid cells or millions of grid cells like the climate models. Rather, they divide up the world into regions, for example. And they include economic models, technology models, agricultural models, energy models, population demography. So they, you know, really try to get everything. This is an integrated assessment model. Just put everything that you can think of in there. And, and these are the models that produce the representative concentration pathways. And they make a lot of assumptions about the world. You know, for example, all countries are going to share all their technology. They're all going to be nice to each other. They're not going to try to kill each other. They're all going to cut emissions as much as possible in some cases, or you know, not cut them very much. So these are all the kind of assumptions that they make to get these RCPs. And you can just consider them as possible futures. They're just possibilities about what might happen. So over the next part of this, I'm going to present some kind of results, thinking about using these tools to think about the role of land use, land cover change um, in climate. Um, the first part is going to be, what is the relative role of land use sources versus other anthropogenic sources in the current climate? Okay. So basically, we're going to take that IPCC radiative forcing plot that we talked about and just separate it into two parts. One is land use, land cover change, deforestation, agriculture, pasture usage, all that kind of stuff. And the other one is everything else. Okay? And just see what the, what the importance are if you divvy it up that way. Then the second part of the talk will be looking at the long-term role of land use, land um, cover change in terms of the carbon balance, because in the long term, that's what really matters is the carbon balance. And it's going to be quite a bit on the, say, the deforestation um, budgets and, the, and how to think about those. A really important part of um, land use land cover change can, um, in terms of the climate interaction, can actually occur locally. And um, you can have changes in the surface temperature or runoff because of the changes in the, um, uh, in the land use, uh, especially the land cover. 
And these results in local changes that are very, very important. Um, but these changes don't necessarily scale up to change the global climate. So it's a little bit different when you think about what's happening on a local scale versus the climate impacts. And for this talk, we're going to focus on the global climate impacts, not what you feel at the surface, which is very sensitive to whatever your land use is. I mean, you know that. If you're in, under a tree, you feel a really different amount of incoming insulation from the sun than if you're standing in a field. Okay, It makes a huge difference. We're not really going to talk about that. We're going to talk about that impact then on the global climate. So this is kind of a, a complicated diagram, just talking about all the way that land use and land cover change changes the climate forcings. Um, natural ecosystems have wildfire interactions, which emit aerosols and gases and CO2. Wetlands emit methane. Forests can uh, emit, actually, some aerosols, in fact. But then when you convert that land over to agricultural land, in the process of converting it, Right, that deforestation often. Um, a good part of the emissions could come off in wildfires, uh, kind of instigated by people. Um, depends on what region you're at. It could be 20% of, of the carbon is actually, that's left on the land, that's not extracted, is, is burnt. It all depends on the climate and the region there. But then once the, um, the land has been converted, then there's all sorts of ways that humans can, uh, human land management actually changes the climate forcing of that area. Um, for example, you apply N nitrogen to fields, then you get nitrous oxide emissions. Uh, you um, put in rice paddies and you flood them, you can get methane emissions. You put cows on it, you get methane emissions. Um, all these different types of usage um, can change then the emissions from these different constituents, and it also changes the surface albedo. Okay, um, so we included uh, these calculations um, in, in a couple different ways. Um, uh, we we have a prog some prognostic fire algorithms within our model. We can do the carbon balance within our model, things like that. I, I don't want to go too much in the details. Um, if you know, for example, how the IPCC calculates those things, I'll just say we did it in a consistent way with the IPCC. And if you don't know what that means, that's okay. All right, we did it in a in a rigorous way. Let's just put it that way. Um, and you know, uh, I'm not sure how much of this I want to talk about. I think I did most of this already. So we're just, uh, we're changing the emissions, but, but also let's, uh, let's think a little bit more about the surface albedo. So um, I, I think it's a, an effect that people aren't always aware of, but when you, for example, uh, deforest at mid-latitudes like we are here, or high latitudes where there's snow on the ground, you really can have a big, uh, a strong surface albedo effect. So in the springtime, the trees with the snow are darker. They have a lower surface albedo. And so therefore, they're absorbing more solar radiation than the snow would have done on a field. Okay, And so what people have calculated um, in, in these papers here um, is that in the high latitude, actually deforestation could cool the planet. Okay, Even though you're emitting all that CO2, you, you could actually be cooling the planet with deforestation. Okay, So that means we want to go out and deforest in high latitudes? No, no, no. But it's something that we really want to think about, that reforestation and afforestation, you know, that carbon is no longer in the atmosphere, and, and that's good, and it's nice to have trees, but it might not be as uh, good at, at stopping climate change as you might think. So one needs to be a little bit careful because of the surface albedo interactions. Um, as, as an example, here at Cornell, Tim Fahey and a group of uh, others of us are leading an ACSF project to take a look at the importance of the albedo for Ithaca, because part of the Cornell Climate Action Plan is actually to offset some of our fossil fuel emissions by reforestation or intensive forest growth. So this is, um, this is going to be interesting for us to see what the albedo effects are here locally. But it's something to think about. And this isn't, um, this isn't short-lived. This is kind of permanent as long as you have that deforestation, right? So that's a constant forcing, and it's not something that just kind of goes away. The, the total effect of this is actually controversial still. So um, this will be interesting to see how important we find it, it is for Ithaca, for example. So here's the results from our study where we're attributing, we're taking that whole radiative forcing um, from the whole uh, 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 from the IPCC, and we're basically divvying it up. 
Land use, everything else. Land use, land cover change, <laughs> deforestation, agriculture, pasture usage, everything on the land, and everything else in another category. Now, one important thing we didn't do was include the fossil fuel emissions associated with agriculture, which can actually be quite strong. But, but we didn't include that in the land use, land cover change. Those are included over on the other category. So here the yellow means this is from the last IPCC, the AR5. The green is the land use, land cover change, green for the plants. And then the brown is for everything else, all other anthropogenic emissions. So here for CO2, this is fossil fuel emissions, concrete emissions, things like that. Um, so you can see you know, about 20% of the CO2 in the atmosphere right now causing the radiative forcing is from land use land cover change. So that's uh, pretty much equivalent to, to what everybody has thought. And you can see that our numbers, the way we did it, match very well what the IPCC got. And that's because we did it in a consistent way. We did it basically the same way they did. We just divvied things up differently. For nitrous oxide, most of the nitrous oxide emissions are coming from land use land cover change from agriculture. So the green dominates there. Methane, quite a bit of it is from uh, agriculture. And so then the green uh, contribution then is there, and then the, the brown would be from other sources of methane. Ozone is predominantly from uh, other anthropogenic sources, not from land use like cover change. It's a small contribution. For aerosols, uh, aerosols are really tricky. I, I spent a lot of my life thinking about aerosols. Um, they're really tricky, and there's ways that land use land cover change can increase aerosol emissions and decrease aerosol emissions, go both ways. When we considered everything we could, we decided that land use land cover change was a net zero impact on the radiative forcing. And so that basically means that all the, um, the aerosol forcing is from other anthropogenic sources, fossil fuels, things like that. Now, we did uh, re... Um, uh, move our, our aerosol forcing to match the IPCC estimates because like most models, our model actually overestimates the aerosol impacts. So otherwise, if we used our model result, we would have had a much bigger negative here associated with aerosols. Um, we have a, a smaller negative uh, effect from land um, albedo changes. And then when you sum all of these up here, you can see that while the CO2 radiative uh, forcing, or the, the CO2 contribution and radiative forcing is about 20%. The total radiative forcing from land use land cover change is 40%, okay? And that's partly because of the additional nitrous oxide and methane, but it's also because the aerosol, the negative forcing, is all being put onto fossil fuel emissions, you can think of it, right? That's where the dirty air pollution is coming from, for the most part, is from those. And that's cooling right now. So that means that per CO2 emitted, land use land cover change contributes about twice as much radiative forcing as, say, fossil fuels and other anthropogenic sources. Okay? So this is what's happening in, in the current climate. Let's think about what will happen um, out into 2100. Now, when we um, think about climate projections, one thing to keep in mind is that the representative concentration pathways that we use to, to do the simulations out to 2100, um, it turns out that there was a narrow range in deforestation in, in those estimates. There was a, a lot of work done on the RCPs to make sure they had different amounts of uh, radiative forcing, and nobody thought about whether their land use land cover change scenarios were similar or different. And it turns out they're very similar. And it's actually true also for aerosols, if they're aerosols, it's very similar. Um, and also, so, so if you look at, you know, these are all the RCPs right here in red. And um, they're, they're pretty close together. This is the amount of uh, forest, right, at, at 2010. Here's if we reforested, lost the, what deforestations occurred. Um, these are the RCPs. Here's the estimate from the FAO for um, the last 10 years. The, so the FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization, estimates the, the deforestation rate. So it's higher than any of the RCPs are estimating for, current, uh, for the current climate, as well as out into the future. Um, previously, the FAO was estimating a higher deforestation rate when the Amazon was really being deforested. Um, so that, that we've recovered some here. But a recent satellite-based estimate from 2013, this Hansen et al., says that these FAO estimates are low 
okay? And the deforestation is occurring much more rapidly than people thought previously. And this is much more deforestation than the models are predicting, okay? Um, so it, it seems to me a little bit naive to assume that we're going to have deforestation going into the future that is, it, that is really quite small. It's less than we have currently. Um, uh, you know, we can, we can hope that the Amazon stays um, uh, with really slow rates of deforestation, but actually the, the president of Brazil, um, you know, they, there's a huge economic and political crisis there, as, as mentioned, reopening up the Amazon for, for um, exploitation, which means deforestation. Um, it, I, so I think it's, it's quite optimistic to, the, these RCPs are really optimistic. I mean, let's hope there's that low of deforestation, but I'm not sure that, that it's true. So we, we put together a theoretical extreme case here, which is way higher than what's happened in the past, and hopefully this will not happen, but just to see what the impact would be on the radiative forcing. And maybe if we did business as usual, which could be something like the Hansen et al., it would be, I don't know, uh, maybe a third of the way from the RCP 8.5 to the theoretical extreme, if we just use that as kind of maybe what, what we might want to think about a realistic estimate for the future. So if we think about future radiative forcings, here, you know, CO2. So here we're using the RCP 4.5 for the non-land use land cover change, this brown here. If we were using the 8.5, we'd uh, have a, a much larger, of course, it, it, this is 2100 uh, radiative forcings. And then here's from the different, uh, D, uh, the CO2 from the different land use land cover change from the different RCPs. And then this uh, darkest one is this theoretical extreme case, which hopefully will never happen, but kind of gives you a bound on how big it can be. Um, so, uh, you know, maybe the business as usual case might be about 2.5 watts per meter squared uh, contribution to future radiative forcing from land use land cover change, which, which is quite a bit, right? That's um, uh, way more than um, what most of the RCPs are estimating, which is only about one watt per meter squared. So it's, it's quite a bit more than, than people are estimating the RCPs, because I think the RCPs are quite optimistic there. The other interesting thing is, in, is on this 100-year time scale, the radiative forcing per CO2 emitted is, is again, it's two to three times the radiative forcing emitted from fossil fuels, okay? So if we're going to care about, you know, CO2 and really spend our time thinking about the CO2 emissions, we, land use land cover change is, will cause even more warming than you would have thought um, if you're focusing on CO2 on these 100-year time scales. Okay, and it's again because of the, the negative aerosol emissions as well as the additional greenhouse gases from methane and nitrous oxide or predominantly from land use land cover change. Um, I'm going to skip that right now. Now let's think about what's going to happen longer term in the future. And um, one really important thing to realize is when you're thinking about CO2, that about half the CO2 that humans have emitted you know, from here, here are the budget's just the fossil fuel CO2 emissions, which we have really good records of because people paid money for it, so we have records of it. Um, about, so this, this is our emissions here and um, this blue line. And then the amount that's staying airborne is here. This, this red line is the, the mean of all the yellow which is our observations of the CO2 that's accumulating in the atmosphere. So we have pretty good observations of what's accumulating in the atmosphere. So how are we emitting you know, per year way more than is staying in the atmosphere? Well, it's because the land and the ocean are acting as huge negative feedbacks, okay? But the land and the ocean take up quite a bit of this anthropogenic CO2 that we're emitting, half of it approximately. And a really important question is, is that going to continue in the future, okay? Because we, you know, if we could bank on it, then we, we would know better how much we could emit, okay? Now, um, Professor Goodall is going to talk more about how far forest takes up carbon and things like that. Um, and uh, so there, you'll, you'll get more details. But the, um, the important thing is that the, the land and the atmosphere really act as, as really large negative feedbacks because they're taking up all this carbon dioxide. Now, I think you've seen this slide before, too, looking at the carbon cycle. This is from the, the old the AR4 um, IPCC. 
But um, there, there are huge fluxes, say, for example, between the terrestrial biosphere and the atmosphere um, in terms of, of carbon fluxes. And um, there's more being taken up in the land, for example, than being emitted from the land. And that's this uptake of the anthropogenic carbon that's being put into the atmosphere. And similarly in the ocean, there's this huge fluxes between uh, the ocean and the atmosphere in different parts of the globe. And it turns out that the ocean is taking up more than it is emitting. Okay, and these, you know, these are huge natural fluxes and very small deviations that we're seeing because of the anthropogenic carbon, but very important changes, right? Half of what we've emitted into the atmosphere is being taken up by the, um, by the, the ocean and the land carbon. If we um, want to think about where this is happening, say, say on land, um, well, one thing we want to think about is what's called the net primary production, NPP. This is the new carbon taken up from the biosphere. So the CO2 is taken up into the plants, into the trees, or any other kind of plant, and um, then turned into organic material. Okay? And then that's called net primary production. And of course, the places where that's is maximum you know, are the, the forests of the world. This is kind of an old satellite image here but um, quite a bit in the tropical forest, for example. As we move forward in time and trying to understand what the carbon budgets are going to be, what, what we used in the last IPCC to look at this were uh, scenarios where the um, concentration of CO2 was fixed, right? It was that RCP, representative concentration pathway. And here, for example, the red line is the RCP 8.5. And here's our integrated assessment model scenario um, it, with this kind of white and red line. And then um, the Earth system models then calculate how much carbon the land and the ocean take up. And you can then from that estimate what the fossil fuel emissions are that are compatible or allowable to get that concentration pathway um, based on the estimate from the model of how much carbon was taken up by the land and how much carbon was taken up by the ocean, okay? So your allowable fossil fuel emissions is your carbon in the atmosphere, changing carbon in the atmosphere that you know from the RCPs, it's a fixed. <laughs> then the carbon that goes into the land in whatever model you have and the carbon that goes into the ocean in whatever model you have. And so you can see here all these lines here. This, this is the spread in the models, basically. And the, the spread is because both changes or differences between the carbon models that are used in these different models, there's you know, 20 or 30 different models in the world, um, as well as these models also have different physical climates. So they might move the precipitation here or there. So there's, this is a, a really a, a three-dimensional um, simulation here that I'm, I'm putting up as a, as a whole bunch of spaghetti plots, basically. But this is, this is how, during the last IPCC, we thought about fossil fuel emissions and allowable emissions here. So what we did using our uh, climate model, the community or system model, which is the NSF model, is, is we didn't just go out to 2100. Most of the time in the IPCC, you can see most of the figures, most of the simulations only go out to 2100, okay? And for the RCP 8.5, this uh, highest one that certainly before Paris we were on that trajectory for, it, it, we haven't even stabilized CO2 at that rate. It's, it's still going up at, at 2100. And um, the system has not come into equilibrium at all. So what we did was we extended these runs out to 2300 to really think about the long term and think about what the carbon cycle is going to do on the longer term. And so here is the, the CO2 that you get from 1850. Here's 2100. You know, here's 2000. Here's 2100. 2200, it starts to stabilize about 2,000 parts per million. That's what we're talking about here um, with uh, the RCP 8.5 and um, extended 8.5. Um, almost 2,000 parts per million. Okay, so if we don't do anything, th this is, would be where we would get at, even with advances in technology. Then the surface temperature increase, the globally average surface temperature increase that you'll get in that case would be this red line, and it goes up to about 9 um, degrees K, globally averaged. And of course, usually the temperatures are much bigger over land, over the um, northern um, land regions, mid-latitude to high land regions. So what we did uh, is not only have uh, simulations with, um, uh, with the models, with 
you know, the, the normal RCP 8.5 land use scenarios that are given to us from the integrated assessment models. But we also did some additional experiments, for example, where we just didn't include the land use estimates from the RCP 8.5. We just left land use at the same levels as the pre-industrial, whatever that is. Um, very little land use. And in addition, we can also turn off the impact of um, CO2 onto the climate. Okay, so obviously in the real world we can't do any of these things, but this is a model, and we can do these things very easily, and we can just figure out what happened. Now, now these are these are actually pretty long runs, so I say pretty easily. Yeah, I mean it, it only takes a little bit to flip the switch, and then you sit around for three or four months and wait for the model to do several hundred years simulation. Okay, so this is quite a bit of computer time we're talking about here, but um, but we can do these kind of things on the su supercomputers. So there's actually four different simulations we'll talk about. We'll talk about a, a coupled, where the climate is coupled with land use, and another simulation without land use. And then another set of simulations, no anthropogenic forcing, no anthropogenic climate forcing, but the um, biosphere feels the elevated CO2, and um, no anthropogenic forcing without land use. Okay. So let me focus in on, on this slide here, which is the, uh, or this plot right here, which is the total land carbon. So if we take the case, uh, 1850, there's maybe about 1,150 petagrams of carbon in the land, in the model. And then with time, um, if we have no climate impact and no land use, about 1,800 petagrams of carbon go into the land. So what that means is that the land is seeing these higher levels of CO2 and it's sucking down extra carbon. That anthropogenic carbon that's in the atmosphere is enhancing the growth of the plants on land in this model and, and they're sucking down that uh, carbon into the land. And it turns out it mostly actually goes into the trees, which kind of makes sense. That's where most of the net primary productivity occurs. It's plausible. We don't know. We haven't seen elevated CO2 impacts on trees for several hundred years, but it's plausible. Then if we add in the impact of climate, this climate impact here, the difference between this dotted black line and the dotted red line, um, it, there's a decrease in the amount of carbon that's going into the land. Um, and that is a combination of effects. Climate change in high latitudes can often enhance the productivity. For example, it lengthens the growth, growing season. You know, up in Canada or Russia, it lengthens the growing season. It's good, the plants like it, they can take up more carbon. But in the tropics, it can um, shift, well, any, any place where it shifts the precipitation away, gets a little more arid, that could cause a reduction in the um, uptake of carbon. And um, in addition, it, it could get too hot also in the tropics. It's unclear there. So that's the climate impact. And that's actually been discussed a great deal, the, the, um, the penalty for climate and, and how difficult if you take one of these high scenarios like the um, RCP 8.5, it's going to be um, because there's going to be much less carbon being taken up by the land and the ocean actually under uh, really warm climates, potentially. We don't know for sure, but that's what a lot of the models say. Here we're going to focus on the land use land cover change impact. And so that's going to be the difference between this dotted red line and this red line here. So instead of taking up carbon, as it did, if you have no land use land cover change, it, it actually, the um, terrestrial biosphere is uh, a source of carbon to the atmosphere. It, it's not helping at all because of the land use land cover change. Okay. If we go back and we think about the allowable emissions, and remember this is how much fossil fuel emissions you're allowed to stay on this representative concentration pathway. Um, you know, out at 2100 to 2200, the difference between these lines is really small, okay? For the RCP 8.5, emissions are dominated by fossil fuel, concrete. I mean, the, the standard things that we all worry about about climate change. There's, there's no doubt in this simulation or other simulations that, that energy, the energy sector has to be switched over, okay? Um, but, you know, these, these differences here between, say, the red line and the red dotted line, they, they actually are almost five um, petagrams of carbon per year, which, to give you context, it's about what we're emitting right now, okay? So there, there's actually pretty big differences at 2100 that in your allowable fossil fuel emissions uh, whether or not you have land use land cover change 
It's just that you have huge fossil fuel emissions, so you're not really seeing it here very much, okay? This comes back to we, we have to deal with energy policy. But there, but there are, you know, discernible impacts of land use land cover change here. In fact, the land use land cover change impacts in these, this model simulation are actually more important than climate. So this climate impact has been well documented. People have talked about it within um, my field and people know about it. Um, but the land use land cover change impacts have not been emphasized very much. Um, and, and yet they're more important, maybe twice as important um, uh, uh, when you're going out to 2200, 2100. So um, if we think about what's going on in an individual stand here, um, and uh, you know, this, the, some tree stand might in 1850 have, you know, what, what is this about, I don't know, 62 in some unit, giga, giga uh, what is that, grams of carbon per unit of whatever um, here. And then with time, as we go up to 2300, this natural stand would have accumulated this extra carbon here uh, following this black line. Okay, so we're just picking some some location, and uh, maybe it even gets gets too hot or something. So then it, it peaks out and it starts decreasing in how much carbon it can hold. So this is what happens in the natural system. And let's say you know, say with these blue lines, um, instead we don't let that plot be natural. We convert it to agriculture or some kind of wood harvesting, regular wood harvesting. Well, there, there's a couple different terms that we want to think about here. One is that you know, the, the carbon we physically take off that plot, we keep track of normally. We have some estimates for that carbon. And I, I call that the direct carbon emission. So we, we almost always keep track of that. But then um, there's quite a bit of carbon that's left on the site, um, which here we, we call the quasi-direct carbon, but that carbon um, is sometimes in included in the numbers and sometimes not included in the numbers, depends on uh, which numbers. And then this loss of this sink in the future, the natural sink, right, this loss of this uptake of carbon that would have occurred on the natural lands um, is almost never included in the estimates, and it, it can be quite big here, right, this, this potential um, indirect carbon here that, that we show here at the maximum, that can be quite big um, in this slide. And, um, and actually, in reality, it can be quite large. So this is almost never included in the numbers, this kind of loss of natural sink. Normally, people don't think about that. But if we do uh, an attribution, then, of you know, our difference, here we have this difference in uh, the land use land cover change carbon in the land here versus down here, and we try to attribute that, we see, you know, this is the direct carbon from a bunch of different places in these blues. It's about 30% of the total loss of carbon. Then this quasi-direct, which sometimes is included and sometimes not, it's maybe, a, uh, what is it, 17%. But this part that's never included, people know, just really, they, they know it exists, but they don't include it in the numbers, um, is 44% of the total. And so actually the, the parts that normally aren't included are 60% of the total carbon loss. Okay, So there's a little bit of a budget problem. If you're just looking at the deforestation carbon that people take off the land when they deforest, you're missing a lot of the problem. Okay, um, And it, it actually depends when the deforestation occurs, how much of it you're missing. Right? The deforestation occurs close to the beginning of the time period, 1850. You're missing most of it. But if the deforestation occurs here, the red, at the end of the time period, you're missing less of it. Okay? You've actually seen most of the anthropogenic sink taken up by the land. And so you can think of this amplification factor that it involves with time. It starts out maybe at 3 and goes down to 2.5 at 2100 when land use land cover change, um, when the conversion stops in this model simulation. So it, it kind of goes down with time. Um, right now, the amplification factor is 2.6. So whatever deforestation carbon numbers you think are happening right now, you should multiply them by 2.6 to include the, the real numbers um, there. Um, and and you, you need to also be thinking about the fact that the trees are doing a lot of the work. And a lot of times, the deforestation is directed at the trees. And that's also an important part. And if you only go up to 2100 instead of 2300, you're also going to be not including all the effects of the, of the sinks out there. So 
Um, those, are, those are ways that we cannot be including all the effects of land use land cover change on the carbon cycle out as far as we need to be thinking about it. So if we think about the long-term implications and we go back to this cumulative anthropogenic emissions and, and the temperature impact, you know, our land use land cover change, CO2, from deforestation, it, it probably causes twice as much radiative forcing as fossil fuel or other anthropogenic emissions of CO2 because we're missing that loss of a natural sink, okay? Um, now, I should say, you know, this is, this is one model study. We shouldn't go home and, you know, write this in concrete. This needs to be verified by other scientists. But I think it's an interesting way to look at the problem that really, I mean, we're pretty sure there's these, the, the loss of the natural sinks um, into the future if you deforest. Um, but how big it is, that's, that's a really uh, an important question. Um, now, when we think about land use, land cover change, there were all these complicated issues that we didn't talk about here. So we're, we're not really addressing. We're just addressing one small piece of it. And you know, the land use, land cover change right now is responsible for 20% of the CO2, but it's 40% of the current radiative forcing. So it's likely to continue under the different RCPs out to 2100. So we really probably should think about agriculture if we're thinking about anything out to 2100. It's a pretty important component. Now, um, in the long time scales, the, the CO2 from land use land cover change could also cause about two to three times as much radiative forcing um, because of this loss of the carbon sink, because you're removing land from the natural carbon sources. So I guess what the take home message I want you to, um, to take from here is that, that energy has to remain the primary issue. I mean, hopefully we can get off the RCP 8.5 by switching off of carbon-based fuels. But deforestation, as well as agriculture, can be really important components of climate issues. But there's a lot of complicated issues about what specific locations you want to protect or what, what policies you want to use that um, we haven't talked about here at all. Um, all um, I'm trying to argue is that um, there, there could be some good co-benefits from protecting biodiversity on the, on the climate problem. And, and so we want to keep thinking about it. And agriculture is, is really could be quite important. And trying to feed 10 billion people um, and keep some biodiversity on the planet and, and you know, fitting that into climate change is a really interesting and, and important problem that hopefully you guys will, will go after and address. Thank you. If anybody has any questions, I can bring the mic to you for the video. Uh, so just raise your hand and I'll come find you with the microphone. Hello, thank you. Could you talk a little bit about uh, soil in relationship to land use, land cover? You talked about uh, trees, um, how important is soil, and uh, carbon sequestration and soil. I, I skipped right over it. It's, it's in the fine print somewhere. Let me see here. Um, we don't see a strong soil response, and we think it's because our model isn't very good. Okay, But um, I, I think that there's a huge role of soil carbon, not just for the soil degradation issues, but um, also for um, climate. But I don't think it's going to qualitatively change what we're talking about here. I mean, I went and looked at the numbers. It's not qualitatively changing, but it could quantitatively definitely change the numbers, and we're, we're going to underestimate that. The, the particular model we use, the version of the model we used, is going to under, underestimate that. But on the 100-year you know, time scale, it's hard to get a lot of carbon into soils. But we, we should be trying, and there's a lot of people here who know more about it than I do. Um, at the beginning, you mentioned the idea of setting aside half of Earth. Is that at all realistic? And like, how much of Earth do you think you would, like occupy already? Um, I, let's see. I think agricultural lands are like thirty percent of the planet, or something like that. And managed land is another thirty percent. Uh, and then, you know, and that's focused on certain ecosystems, shall we say, that probably some of the most productive. So um, I think that's an, a great 
question uh, that I that's totally outside my area of expertise. And I, I think it's also a value judgment. I think we should decide what we want to do with our lands and, and see whether that's doable. It was interesting now they hear you take it up to 2300 and just like you know the climate modelers haven't done a lot of that looking that far into the future the people doing uh, experiments on how plants respond to carbon dioxide haven't looked a lot at the concentrations those concentrations but the few studies i've seen a lot of plants actually you know there's it's way less than the so-called CO2 fertilization effect. It actually it does damage to plants at that high of CO2 because the leaves become deformed because the sugars build up in the leaves. You start forming large starch granules that then destroy the chloroplasts and you have these creepy looking leaves and plants don't grow well. So it's a, it's a call for a new realm of uh, CO2 experiments now to look at that. Sounds like a good good topic, yeah. We have time for a few more questions if anybody has any. What about the, the north uh, permafrost and, and the methane coming out of it? it do you have a, an opinion on that? Uh, so um, there's a uh, Mm. Yeah, there's uh, some literature about um, then the permafrost, which uh, uh, is frozen carbon in the soils, um, becoming destabilized and coming out either as methane or CO2. Um, this isn't my area of research. It's not included in the, in the models here. I, I think it's a really interesting potential feedback that we should um, think more about. Most of the estimates I've seen suggest it's not as likely to happen as some other potential uh, feedbacks, but... Um, it's it's kind of hard to know, right? All righty. Um, if no one has any more questions, let's thank Professor Mahal again. This has been a production of Cornell University. On the web at cornell.edu.